typo is because my computer wouldn't let me spell out don't worry and get it on one line. So I had to put no worry. It doesn't make any difference. It gets the point across. We've actually brought two lessons and really two main points that we were trying to get across in, in those two lessons, and they're real important to build on. Number one is a lot of what we do has to depend on how we respond to something. Remember, perhaps the one phrase that I think sums it up more than anything else is focus on what is left and not what has been lost. Can we say that again? Focus on what is left and not what has been lost. That's so important. In our neighborhood, a young man who goes to Good Pasture uh, High School, uh, at the first of the summer or right toward the end of school, one of his buddies was over at his house. This is what we understand. Our neighbor, Bobby Cox, lives right around the corner from him, and he told us about it, was standing between his car and the garage, and he was about to leave, and they were saying their goodbyes or whatever, and he thought he had it in reverse, and he had it forward, and he drove him into the garage door. He came home from the special hospital in Atlanta on Friday. They asked us to put out signs that said, Welcome home, Caleb, and balloons, and we did that. He's paralyzed from the waist down. It will be so important for that young man to focus on what is left and not on what has been lost. It's encouraging when I read about some of the headways and things that they're making in that line with the spinal column, but as of today, there's not a, a, a real cure for that kind of situation. Two things, focus on what is left and not what has been lost, and then it, our mental attitude toward it. it can make such a tremendous help. You know, we talk about happy, happy, happy. God does not promise us what? Happiness. Well, I, you've got to fill in that blank. God does not promise us happiness. Never. He does tell us to rejoice. He said rejoice in everything. Rejoice, and again he said, I say rejoice. And when Paul wrote that, he was writing it from where? A prison. I, 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 this is feedback time. He wrote it while he was in, in prison. See, joy, there's a big difference between joy and happiness. God does promise us joy. That joy, though, has to come from within. The day we talk about worry. Now, if I put a title on the day's lesson, it would be winning over worry. You mean you can actually win over worry? Yeah. We're going to look at that real carefully. You remember the song? <laughs> you remember this back in the late 80s? Don't worry. Be what? Be happy. I, I've got some of the words of that song. Here's the little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. Okay? In life, we may have some trouble, but when you worry, there you go, you make it double. Don't worry. Be happy. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came back and took your bed. <laughs> Don't worry. Be happy. The landlord says your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry. Be happy. Now, I'm not trying to trivialize worry because I suppose it's a it's the greatest single problem in America today. If it were classified as a disease, it'd probably be the number one disease. A survey was taken a number of years ago among some 600 psychologists, and they were asked the question, what's the one of the greatest problems that you feel like that you're faced with? You know what the overwhelming answer was? I worry I don't have what it takes. Now, these are the guys that are helping you with your problems. See? <laughs> Maybe the reason they went into it was because they needed some help. I don't know. But that's, uh, that, that was by an actual, actual survey. Worry, folks, is a prayer to the wrong God. It really is. God does not want us to worry. Worry literally can harm the very tissues of the body. Cause high blood pressure, heart problems, stomach ulcers, hypertension, you name it. And worry can, can cause those things. 
Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 11 and in verse number 28. He said, you come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Give you rest. God didn't design us to be full of worry. Peter tells us how to do it. He said, cast all your cares upon him because what? He cares for you, period. Worry. Well, I, I'm told that the Anglo-Saxon word for worry literally means to choke or to strangle. And that's probably a pretty good, pretty good definition of it. <laughs> well, what do we worry about? He probably could answer that in one word, couldn't we? Uh, let me ask. If I were to ask you to answer in one word what we worry about, what would that one word be? Oh, isn't that amazing? Almost all of you said the same answer. We worry about everything. The truth of the matter is we even worry about people that don't worry. My wife and I knew a man out in Texas by the name of Don Holder who worked for the railroad company, and I'm not sure which one it was, but I saw him one day, and he said, John, you find, if you know anybody who wants any work to be done, I'm looking for some odd jobs. I said, Don, what happened to your job? Working with the railroad guy. He said, I got fired. I said, you did? I said, oh, Don, that's terrible. He had a wife and two kids. He said, John, I'm not worried. It was unjust firing, and I've already appealed to the board, and I will be restored to my job. I will get all of my back pay, and I'll get it with interest on. I'm not concerned about it at all. I had some people at church that tell me, I'm worried about Don Holt. I said, why is that? He said, he's lost his job and he's not even worried. <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, that is the absolute truth. We worry about everything. We worry, we worry about our weight, don't we? Now, to those of you who are like me and you struggle with your weight, I guarantee you, if you got on the scales this morning or sometime this past week, you looked at that crazy thing and thought, I need to buy a new, new one. I'm sure there's something wrong. We worry about our weight because if we're too heavy or even if we're too... Oh, now, to those of us that struggle with our weight, we'd love to be that person that can eat anything they want to eat and never gain an ounce, right? Unless you happen to be that person that eats and eats and eats and can't gain any weight. I had a friend that I was growing up in high school. He was actually two years ahead of me. We weren't that close in high school. We did play a little basketball together. We'd... Uh, he and we ended up going to the same college his junior and senior year and my freshman and sophomore year and we got a lot closer because we were in the same social club and we played some sporting events together and he was skinny as a rail he literally could I mean he could out eat anybody and never gain a pound and he told me one time he said I get sick of hearing all those jokes about you could stand under a clothesline in a downpour and not get wet And I'm thinking today, boy, wouldn't that be great if that would, would be true? We worry about it. We worry about our looks. Isn't it amazing? Sometimes you'll look at some of the most beautiful people in the world. And when they look in the mirror, they only see a flaw. And you'd say, I'll swap faces with you in a heartbeat. We worry about our hair. <laughs> now... There, there are some people that don't worry about it. <laughs> we, worry, we worry about, uh, you, you name it, we just worry about everything. We worry about money, don't we? We worry about how to get money, how to spend money, how to save it. We even worry about our neighbors who have money. Now, I know you've heard this before. We buy things that we don't need, spend money that we don't have, to keep up with people that we don't even yeah you've heard it before see but isn't it isn't there a lot of truth in that now that doesn't mean it's an absolute truth but there is a lot of truth we just worry about any and everything we worry about the economic condition in the last five or six years we haven't had the best of times in america and it hadn't come back i it's my understanding that the average income is actually down even what it was in, two, in the year 2008 Perhaps the greatest worry we have is the fear of dying. 
And then you meet somebody who is not afraid of it. I, when my brother was very, very ill, and they wanted to transfer him to Baylor Hospital in Dallas, he said, I don't want to go. He said, I'm ready to go. See? But to some people, we worry about that. We worry about our, our age. See, we're getting it. We worry about how old we are. <laughs> Tom, uh, Dr. Tom gave me a little note this morning. He said, Bob Hope said, you know you're getting old when the candles on your cake cost more than the cake does. <laughs> Isn't that good? I'm going to tell my mom that. She's 96, you know. <clears throat> And this past week, Elvis came back from the dead and came over to the assisted living place where she's living and put on a show, and she had a picture taken with him. We happen to know him. He, he goes to church with our, where our daughter goes to church. I actually went to Harding University, and it was a lot of fun. But we just worry about everything. Well, who worries? You could answer that in one word, too, isn't it? Who worries? Everyone or everybody. If some of you are thinking right now, preacher, don't tell me you don't worry. If you were where I am, you'd be worrying. But you know what? The truth of the matter is, worry is not an inherited trait. We're not born with it. It's a learned behavior. When a baby comes into this world, <laughs> I hope I can say this, baby, and, he, and the baby says, he doesn't sit there or lie there and say, oh, my star, what am I going to do? I got to poop and I got clothes on. Am I, am I right? He just, he lets you worry about that thing. And when he gets hungry, it doesn't worry about it. It just starts crying. And it knows if it cries loud enough, long enough, you're going to do something about it. And before long, that baby's got that mom and dad trained. <laughs> Every time it whimpers, mom and dad run around there and jump. But learn, let me tell you, worry it's a learned behavior. It really is. If worry was classified as a disease, it'd be the number one disease in the world. Do you, uh, you, you heard about the guy. I know you've heard this. You've heard a bunch of preachers say that he actually had them engrave on his tombstone. You want to help me out? I told you I was sick. My wife got it. It was her uncle that didn't know it wasn't. I've actually seen a picture of a tombstone, and it was carved and engraved on it. I told you I was sick. You know the difference between a psychotic and a neurotic? A psychotic believes 2 plus 2 is 5. And he's so convinced of it that if you'll let him talk to you long enough, he'll convince you 2 plus 2 is 5. A neurotic knows that 2 plus 2 is 4, but it worries. Isn't it a beautiful day? Yeah, it's the calm before the storm. Isn't that the prettiest rainbow you ever saw? Yeah, did you see all that mud out there because of that rain? If we're not careful, we just worry about everything. I don't know of any known good that worry has ever done or ever accomplished. Do you? In fact, worry is a whole lot like riding a hobby horse. I, I don't know, when our kids were young, one of, the thing, one of the best things we ever got our kids was a horse. There was tubular steel that went like this on both sides, and then there were springs that hooked onto the horses, two on both sides in the back and front. you remember? And they'd rock in those springs back. Some of you are doing your heads like this. I'm telling you, we'd put our oldest son on that thing, and he would have a blast. And he'd go boom, and he'd get that head down. Did he ever hit the floor with the head of the horse? I'll tell you what, it'd bounce all over the place. It'd stay in a close area. They did, did design them pretty well. In fact, the one we found for him, actually, the mane of the horse was kind of soft. It had uh, made out of hard rubber. So when his head hit it, and it did hit it, <laughs> go back and forth. He'd get on that thing sometime and ride it for an hour or more and just had a blast. It was a great babysitter for a little while. But you know what? He could stay on it for an hour, and guess where he, where he still was? Right where he started. And folks, that's, that's worry. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything. I, 
I want to read uh, from Philippians chapter 4. In fact, I'm going to go to, excuse me, to Philippians chapter 3. Verse 13 and verse 14, he said, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, you know there are two things that we should never worry about. One of them is we should never worry about some things that we can change. Do you ever get in bed late at night in the winter and you realize it's just a little bit too cool? That ever happened to anybody besides me? And you know you want to get up and raise that temperature one or two degrees or maybe get another light blanket or a pair of socks on your feet, but you don't want to put your feet down on the cold floor and you think it'll go away and you toss and you turn and finally about 2 a.m. you get out of bed and you stomp over and you turn to and you go right back to bed and go to sleep. If we can change it, what should we do? If you can change something, what should we do? Come on, change it. Help me out. And then never worry about things that you can't change. Do you hear what Paul said? I do not consider myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind. Why do you think Paul wrote that? Have you ever wondered how in the world could the Apostle Paul even sleep at night? I mean, he stood right there and had a part in the stoning of Stephen to death. He had other people. He traveled and would throw them in prison, and other people literally that he had, had beaten and perhaps others that were also put to death. But Paul said, this is one thing I have to do. I have to put that behind. And we're sitting in the audience tonight, and many of us are looking at our past and our things that we still wish we could change. We have to forget the things that are in the past and press forward to those things that are out there in front. Carolyn and I had four children, and I promise you, I wish I could go back and redo a lot of the things that I said to them and a lot of the ways that I handled some of the things that happened. My kids finally told me one day, Dad, forget it. We've forgiven you about that a long time ago. See, there's some things we can't change, and we just have to pick up and go on from where we are. Now, if you have your New Testament, I want you to follow along with me here. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. And if you don't have it, <clears throat> you may want to just write these verses down, but we're going to be in just in a Sermon on the Mount. This is an extremely important point. Please don't miss it. Matthew 5, beginning with verse 21, I want you to listen carefully to the wording. <clears throat> You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. Notice the wording, do not murder. But I tell you, if anyone argues with his brother and, and he calls him Rekha and being subject to the judgment itself, do not murder and do not hate your brother. Drop down to verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Now, the reason Jesus said do not murder is because if one murdered, it was wrong to do it. Now, I want you to answer me. Is that true or not? Say yes or no. Is it wrong to murder? Do not murder. Is it wrong to commit adultery? Yes or no? Yes. Is it wrong to lust after somebody in your heart and mind? Yes. Okay. Verse uh, 33. Do not break your oaths. But keep the oaths. Do not break your oath. Is it wrong to break an oath? Yes or no? Yes. Chapter 6, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. Is it wrong to call attention to the good that you may do to help somebody that's in need? Yes or no? 
Yeah, we're getting a little softer in our answer. This is important. Stay with me. Verse 5. Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue, thinking they're going to be heard for their long prayers. Is it wrong to pray to be heard of men? Yes or no? Yes. Verse 16. When you fast, do not look as somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show people that they are fasting. The reason Jesus said that is because he said it's wrong to fast and draw attention to what you're doing from a spiritual perspective. Yes or no? Yes. Verse 25. Listen carefully. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Do you already have the point? Worry is not an inevitable thing. Worry is not a given. It is a decision. And it is a learned behavior. It is not something that has to take place. Do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Don't worry about what to wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? I'm in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They did not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? You see how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry. It's extremely important for you and for me to understand to worry is not what God wants us to do. And if it is wrong to do the other things that he said, do not worry, then would you please explain to me why it's not wrong to be a worry war? I think, I think I know what some of you are thinking. Preacher, you trying to tell me you never worry? No, that's not what I'm saying. Let me ask you a question. If I worry, does that make it okay for you to worry? See, it starts back here. God doesn't want us to worry. Now, first of all, I have to recognize and admit to the fact that that it's wrong to do so. Now then the second thing I have to do is I have to understand that there is actually a cure for worry. I, I don't know anybody in here, yeah, I know there is, but I don't know if you want to hold your hands up on this or not. Anybody in here besides me ever have athlete's feet? Did you ever have trouble getting over that stuff? Let me tell you, I'm watching... <laughs> I, Mike could go back, I, I know Mike Roller can go back to the time that when you had athlete's feet, you really didn't get over it. You just kind of controlled it. And I can remember sitting in front of the TV tube in the early 80s, and this advertisement came on television, Micotin cures athlete's feet. And I can remember actually laughing and saying out loud, yeah, sure it does. And I watched that ad on television for weeks. I had athlete's feet at the time. I was playing a lot of tennis and jogging and running, and if you do that, you know, and I couldn't, you could kind of control it. Finally, I said, all right, I'm going to buy some of that stuff. And I bought it. Now, the one thing that you've got to give me credit for, I followed the directions to the letter. And guess what? It cured my athlete's feet. But until I bought the stuff, and put it on and followed the directions. I still had my athlete's feet. I want you to understand 
that there's a cure for worry. And you say, I know what some of the rest of you are thinking. You're thinking, yeah, you just don't understand what I have to go through. I'd like to see you be where I am, live where I live, work where I work, do what I have to do. Well, let me read you something. Don't compare yourself to me. Compare yourself to this person. Are they servants of Christ? I am more. I have been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times received I the Jews 40 lashes, save one. The law was you could give up to 40 stripes, but if you went over 40, then the one that you were giving the stripes to could turn around and give them to you. So they would always stop one short to make sure that in case they had miscounted. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Paul was actually stoned. Now, now hear me. He was stoned to death. I really believe God raised him from the dead. Now, I know the Scriptures doesn't say that. But the Scriptures do say they stoned him and left him for what? Dead. If he wasn't dead, he was so near it. God had to revive him and help revive him, and he did. And then he goes on. He says, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in dangers from rivers, dangers from bandits, dangers from my own countrymen, dangers of the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the country, dangers in the sea. I have labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst more often. I've gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And besides that, I had the care of all of the saints on me that I was concerned about. And yet, Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. The answer, the answer to what Paul is saying is given right here by Jesus in that Sermon on the Mount. There is a cure for it. Here it is. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what we shall wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given unto you. One last scripture. Philippians 4, verse number 6. Why don't we just read it together? You ready? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with present your request to God. You've got to first of all realize that God doesn't want us to worry. You've got to realize that there is a cure for it. And then you have to apply the cure, which is faith, and it's prayer and petition to God with thanksgiving. And you can get rid of the world. Okay. Now remember, I'm just a Western Union boy. I'm just delivering the message. The message is from God. Be happy. Don't worry. And that is a biblical concept. And it's not an inherited trait it's a learned behavior, and it's something that we can overcome. May God help us to turn to him, seek him first, and believe that he'll take away all of our worries and our concerns. Will you just close your eyes? Terry, you get ready to go ahead and start the song in just a minute. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for your willingness to take upon us and to take away our cares. And I pray, Father, that you'll help all of us to take our cares and do as Peter suggested, cast them on you because you truly care for us. Help us to admit that we can stop the worrying. And then with prayers and petitions, cry out to you 
and allow you to do for us which we cannot do for ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Without him I